The following is a recorded session of the City of Cape Girardeau Gun Violence Task Force. The Gun Violence Task Force is a citizen advisory committee of agency partners and community members examining the city government role in gun violence prevention. Thank you for watching. Welcome to the uh, Gun Violence Task Force meeting for today. Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order. We have a task force sign-in sheet that's going to be passed around. If you would take it and pass it around, please. Um, before we move ahead, I'd like for the task force uh, members to just briefly introduce themselves for the good of the group. I'm Jessica Hill, the Executive Director of the State House of Southeast Missouri. I'm Alex Gasser. I'm the Development Director of Southeast Missouri Network Against Sexual Violence. Stacy Kinder, Mayor of Cape Girardeau. Um, Lynn Ware, retired Cape Girardeau Police Department. Trevor Pulley, uh, Deputy City Manager. Josh Brown, Assistant Superintendent of Cape Public Schools. Uh, Lee Schlitt, Broadway Pharmacy. Amber Walker, Principal Checkers Elementary. Arab Kidd, local business owner. Laura Bain, Solo, licensed clinical social worker with Clark. Quinn Roberts, with uh, CDC. Leslie Worston, um, Mom for Man Action at Everett Town for Gun Safety. Dr. Shannon Co. responded for KPD. Melissa Stickle, I'm the Executive Director of Community Partnership in Southeast Missouri. Carlos Vargas, President of CIMO. Adrian Taylor, Junior, Senior Pastor, Lighthouse United Church. Okay, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you to the members of our gallery for being here as well. Uh, the next order of business is to approve the minutes from our August 1st meeting. They are attached in your materials. And uh, Nicolette sent them out in advance as well. Um, besides the fact that the letters on my last name got a little scrambled, um, are there any other um, adjustments that need to be made to the minutes? If not, is there a motion to approve? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the minutes. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. We are going to uh, have our presentation about the court system today, and so uh, we want to welcome the Honorable Presiding Judge Benjamin Lewis, and uh, thank also uh, Mark Wilker for being here today to provide assistance to the community. So we'll turn it over to you, Judge Lewis. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, yeah, I started a jury trial yesterday, and I always start with good morning to all the prospective jurors, and I always say, you can do better than that. <laughs> good, morning. good morning. Thank you. Uh, a little bio so you know where I'm coming from on this stuff. I was born here in 1955. I'm a graduate of Central High School in 1973, graduate of Southeast Missouri State in 1977. I have a uh, B.A. in English, went a minor in psychology. I went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and graduated from law school in 1980 and passed the bar that year. Uh, my senior year, I was clerk. I was interning in the Jackson County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, which led to a job uh, clerking for a circuit judge in downtown Kansas City. A guy, great guy, named Tim O'Leary. The circuit judge, same job that I have now here. Uh, I wanted to stay in Kansas City. I took a job in uh, Independence. Unfortunately, for a whole lot of reasons, my during the toward the end of my clerkship, the sky bridge fell at the Hyatt, killed a whole bunch of people. Those cases were assigned to my judge. He viewed it as a conflict of interest for me to go to work for any firm that had any part of that which was just about anybody who was anybody in Kansas City. That's why I ended up in, a, in Independence. I started coming down here quite frequently to visit somebody uh, whom I did not marry, and uh, which worked out well for both of us. And uh, Al Spradling offered me a job down here. I worked for him for two years. I worked for Richie and Price uh, for five years, and then I ran for associate circuit judge. In between, I ran for the Cape School Board and served about two years on the Cape Girardeau School Board. That was my introduction to politics. Uh, division three, the judge, the position that I took is the criminal intake position presently held by Judge Frank Miller. I did that for four years. 
uh, at the end of that four year term, it was up or out or, or I could stay for, in the same job, but I wanted to be a circuit judge. I ran for circuit judge. I didn't do a very good job as a politician that year. And so I got beat. I went back into private practice, worked with John Layton and Ray Vogel, uh, tried a bunch of lawsuits. I did that for 10 years, ran for circuit judge again, and was elected in 2004. My opponent that year returned the favor. It was an unexpired two-year term. He returned the favor and ran against me in two years. I won again, and then I was unopposed in 2012 and 2018. Circuit judges have six-year terms, which brings us to 2024. And um, why am I not running again? Well, the Constitution of the state of Missouri says that judges state judges, not feds, must retire at 70, which for me is St. Patrick's Day next March. So I could run, but I could only serve 10 weeks, which would be stupid and I don't want to do it. So I'm retiring at the end of the year, December 31st. Frank Miller is the only uh, person who, to my surprise, the only person who signed up to uh, run for division two. Uh, so he will be, unless somebody mounts a surprise effective write-in campaign in three counties, which I don't expect to see, uh, Judge Miller will be in my shoes next, or my seat at least, uh, beginning in January. Uh, I, along the way, I married a local girl. We had two kids. Our son joined the Navy and now lives in Everett, Washington. Our daughter went to uh, got a master's in divinity at Claremont School of Theology and stayed in Los Angeles. So they went as far away as they could get without drowning. Uh, uh, they still love us. We still see them. We talk on the phone all the time, but we do miss them and we have no grandchildren. <clears throat> so out of 44 years as an attorney, I've spent 24 years as a judge. I have had over the last 20 years, I have had half of the felony cases in three counties in Southeast Missouri. I sent you folks the map of the state and the circuits and all that, and a little bit of the, the, uh, the process, not to be relied on by professionals, but um, it gives you an idea of the flow of a criminal case through the court system. And uh, probably just like you folks, from time to time, I'm sitting somebody sitting somewhere after something terrible has happened and somebody says, well, why don't you do something? Why doesn't somebody do something to stop this? And my response is we do. In my opinion, after 20 years of working here with the criminal justice system and seeing every manner of cruelty that any human being can practice on another, but there's bound to be a new one next week. Um, I would say that when something bad happens in Cape, KPD jumps on it right away, or the task force gets called out if it's out in the county. Um, they find, almost always, they find who did it. And almost always, the prosecuting attorney can charge them with it. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And then the prosecuting attorney prosecutes the case and Cape County jury almost always convicts them. And there is not a judge in our circuit or anywhere in Southeast Missouri that I think is shy about imposing significant sentences on people that do terrible things. But, um, and there's nobody in the system anywhere in the chain that I don't trust. Okay, I live here. I intend to continue to live here when I retire. And I think we've got a really good system, but the, the difference between what I do and what legislators do is legislators get to go out on the steps of the Capitol and say, what we're doing here today, it will ensure that this never happens again. And we, the police don't get to say that, and we don't get to say that. The world is full of human beings, and it's going, whatever it is, I'm afraid, is going to happen again. Now, we can minimize it. We can do what we can about it, but I'm afraid it's going to happen again. 
probably the biggest problem that we have, and I think the police and the prosecutor and the judges would agree, is a lack of cooperation on uh, violent crimes. Um, the people that are engaged in that and the people around them hate us more than they hate the person that shot them. We see it over and over again. So when they go out, when I say they, they find out who did it, they can find out who did it, but that doesn't mean that they can be charged unless there are witnesses who will go to court and say what happened. Because when the police find out who did it, uh, the police can't come in and testify, I saw A shoot B. Um, you have to put A on the stand. You have to have, have to put B or somebody that saw it on the stand. An example, in, um, on October 19th of 2017, there was a guy named uh, Dion Coates, small time marijuana dealer. Um, and I tried the jury trial, so I heard, heard the facts in considerable detail. Uh, he's driving down Sprig Street. He pulls up to a house. There are five people sitting on the front porch. He's, his job is to go in and sell them $5 worth of marijuana. As he's getting out of the car, two men with masks come along and shoot him multiple times and take his marijuana and take his cash. The police are there within two minutes. It's close to where the police station was at the time. The police are on it like that. They call the ambulance. They ask him at the scene, who, who were the shooters? And he says he doesn't know, okay? He goes to the police, to uh, St. Francis Hospital where he's being treated and the police go to St. Francis Hospital and they talk to him and they say, who were the shooters? And he says, I don't know. They fly him to Barnes Hospital. And when he wakes up two days later and learns that he will be a paraplegic for the rest of his life, he remembers who the shooters are. Okay. Now, so the police know who the shooters are. I think the police probably had a pretty good idea before he admitted it, but that put a fatal hole in the prosecution's case. How, why do you say it's my client? You said you didn't know, you said you didn't know. And then when you're good and angry, then you try to pin it on my client. And both of those, okay, so both of those cases were investigated by KPD. Both of those cases were prosecuted by the prosecuting attorney and both of those defendants were acquitted and they can never be tried for that crime again. Now, they got convicted of other stuff, not too surprisingly. Uh, the other question I get is, why don't you just lock them all up? Well, last year, last uh, fiscal year, which ended in at the end of June, there were the circuit judges like me across the state disposed of, you, you might want to write this number down, 44,477 felonies, almost 45,000 felonies, 44,000, 44,477. You know how many prison beds we have in the state of Missouri? We have 30,992. And that's not for 2023 felonies, We've got, I've got people in prison from 20 years ago, okay? And uh, Bill Seiler has people in prison from 30 years ago and maybe from 40 years ago. There are people doing life without parole in prison. So we have much less prison space than we have, than we have felons, okay? And essentially, if you put one in, they push one out someplace. They can't, they just can't hold them. Most of them end up, we put, mo we, except for what you're concerned about, uh, gun violence, most people make probation. We you hear about people being shipped off for minor drug offenses. We, we don't do that. We, we, there's a step, we 
give them a suspended imposition sentence and put them on probation. And then we get a, they, uh, maybe they have to do a treatment program. And we, uh, there's a whole series of steps to try to not have to incarcerate people. Um, I'm not sure that that's the effective way to do it, but the fact of life is only 30,992 beds. Um, and for those of you keeping score, uh, for the feminist team, there are only 3,173 beds for women and 27,819 beds for men. So men are by far the, the majority of the offenders, okay? And uh, I, I, I tried to call DOC and get some numbers on the cost of incarceration. Uh, didn't get a call back, but the last time I did that 10 years ago, it was about $30,000 a year. And I figured it has to be at least $40,000 a year by now, given the cost of everything going up. Um, why do we do plea agreements? Uh, in Cape County last year, we had 676 felonies filed. 14 went to jury trial. That's uh, 2%, which is twice as many as statewide, which was 1%. And why would we do that? Well, hopefully when, if everybody does their job, okay, if the citizens report the crime and the police investigate and they do a credible job of their investigation and they build a file that they turn over to the prosecuting attorney's office, most of the time there really isn't any question about what happened. Uh, the, the defendant was headed uh, east on Broadway, failed to signal at West End, I pulled him over, uh, he consented to the search and I found the methamphetamine. You know, that, that you, can, you can have a motion to suppress and say, well, did he really, uh, did he really uh, agree to that search? Well, now there's a body cam and you can see that he agreed to the search. Um, and there's the methamphetamine in the little bag with the exhibit tag on it right there. there, there most of the time, there's really not much question. Um, sometimes you, if the, if the prosecuting attorney comes in with, and they say, we've got a plea agreement. Okay. So what you're going to be on probation It's going to take us, take a prison sentence, whatever it's going to be. Um, the judge has the right to reject that plea. Okay. If somebody were to come in and say, um, now I can't control what the charge is. The prosecutor has absolute control over the, over the charge. If they wanted to reduce <clears throat> a murder to an A misdemeanor assault, I couldn't stop them. And then the maximum punishment for that would be uh, a year in the county jail. If that doesn't happen, okay? But you could get a situation where it's, uh, it's a serious assault or it's a murder and the, the proposed sentence is just less than I can live with. I, I, don't, I don't think it's just, okay? Or it could be more than I can live with. I don't think that's just. Um, I can reject the plea and make the case go to trial. You can only do that so many times. If you repeatedly reject plea agreements, then you're not going to get plea agreements and you can't try them all. There, there are not enough work days in the year to do that. And um, so you have to, most of the time, you have to go along with the plea agreement. And most of the time, there's not a problem with it. I have, I have rejected plea agreements from time to time, but not very often. Again, remember what I said, in the system that we have here in Cape County, there's not anybody in it that I don't trust. And I don't get outrageous plea agreements presented to me. So I generally speaking, accept them, but I don't have to. And that's where my responsibility comes in. Um, one of the things that 
uh, you hear about in the press sometimes is a system of mass incarceration, which to me, a guy who has imprisoned thousands of people over 20 years, I find that deeply offensive because every single person that I have sent to the Missouri Department of Corrections was either found guilty by a jury of his peers, found guilty by me beyond a reasonable doubt, or stood in front of me and swore under oath that he committed every element of the offense that he was charged with, okay? We don't, we don't go out and just pick up people off the street. We don't draw names out of a hat. These are people that are arrested for a reason, prosecuted for a reason, and convicted for a reason. Nobody's happy about it, but um, it's a fact of life. I, over these years, when, when I agreed to do this, uh, I started thinking of over the last 20 years, and I'm probably gonna have to talk to some people about my experiences when I retire. Um, I called Angel Woodruff, who is Mark's first assistant and who's tried a whole lot of murders and assault cases in front of me over the 20 years. And we kind of went over the, the, the big ones that we could remember. And then we started filling in the gaps with some of the other ones. Um, but it seems to me, and I am not, I'm gonna make it clear, I'm a judge. I am not a criminologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. But they seem to fall into about four buckets. One, and I think this is the one that we need to be most concerned about, is the what I would call the typical street crime offender usually young, 18 and 24, uh, impulsive, almost always acquired the gun illegally. They didn't go to academy. They, they bought it from a guy on the street because it was stolen. When they run the serial number on it, it turns up stolen from here, from Illinois, from someplace. And uh, quite likely possessed it illegally. If he has a prior felony conviction, it's illegal for him to possess the firearm. Uh, those, are, those are difficult cases because there's not, um, there's not much to be, it, it's hard to anticipate that, that really, the, I'll get to what we can do about it here in just a second. Then the second bucket would be more mature offenders, um, mature in the sense that they're older uh, they're bigger. And they also, their guns are also illegally acquired. Uh, and they tend to use their weapons in planned offenses. They carry the gun when they go make a drug deal. They carry the gun when they go rob somebody. Uh, then we have third bucket, older guys who have legally acquired weapons and they shoot family members. Um, that's been not with weapons, but not with firearms, but that kind of thing has been going on since uh, Cain killed his brother. Um, we had uh, Timothy Corrigan uh, a couple of years ago, several years ago now, uh, shot his wife while she was laying in bed reading. He was, I guess, about my the age I am now. He was, and for want of a better term, just a mean old drunk who had it in for his wife. I don't know how you stop that unless you collect up every gun in the entire world. Um, then we go to uh, psychotics and psychopaths. Um, the psychotics, we had... Um, well, there's a lady, I can't talk about pending cases, but we do have a lady that's locked up for um, killing her boyfriend with a samurai sword at Christmas two years ago, all right? And you may remember that there was a picture of her 
I was in California at my sister's house for Christmas, and there's a picture of this lady with this huge grin on her face who'd just been arrested for killing her boyfriend. And she believes that he's, uh, uh, he was possessed by evil spirits. Um, she's, it took two and a half years to get her into a facility out of our jail where she wasn't getting any treatment into the Department of Mental Health and they're trying to restore her to sufficient mental health to realize that what she believes is not a defense to the charge. Until that happens, she's going to stay there. Uh, we had a couple years ago, well, probably about three or four years ago now, a guy named Alonzo Jones. Alonzo Jones was in the median of I-55 he had his one-year-old child under one arm and a nine millimeter in his other hand pointing at it, cars going up and down the interstate. And when he was evaluated, yeah, he was psychotic. But he was psychotic because he used high potency marijuana every day. 10% uh, of people who use high potency marijuana every day will become psychotic. That was not widely publicized when the uh, legalizing marijuana amendment was passed a couple of years ago. Um, when I took his guilty plea, he had been in jail for two years. He was calm. He was polite. He was respectful. His attorney made a good argument that I should put him on probation, but uh, a bunch of the charges had been dismissed in exchange for the plea. And I told him, there's a price to be paid for what you did, okay? So I sent him to the Department of Corrections for seven years. He's probably already out. Uh, but it, how do you deal with the, the psychotics? Then you have psychopaths. Um, I had... Um, when I was in, right after I graduated from Southeast, Timothy Kreitzer started his killing spree in Cape Girardeau. Um, one of the people he killed was a friend of mine, a young lady who was a friend of mine from college. Uh, time passed and uh, criminal investigation uh, techniques improved and uh, we had a detective at Kate PD, who worked tirelessly, and he was able to figure out that Tim Kreitzer did it. And he pled guilty. He, I took his plea on murdering five women and uh, raping. There were eight counts of rape. Some of the women that were murdered were also raped. But um, he was psychotic because of his upbringing. He had a problem with his mom. Uh, and some of those were murders with guns and some of them weren't. Uh, women, I, I, when I was writing this up, I uh, made a note that I hadn't seen a woman, uh, I couldn't recall a woman using a gun in a crime, and then last week I got one. <laughs> she shot a guy from her back porch, or shot at a guy from her back porch. So that is, a, that is a trend that's increasing. And increasingly, women are willing to be assaulted, um, mostly to other women. Now, of those people, the, the typical street crime guy, the mature offender, uh, the older guys who are mean and have guns, the psychotics and the psychopaths, we pass by them every day shoulder to shoulder, in traffic, at Walmart, at the park, and you're never aware of them until they commit a crime that's in our zone, okay? When it's in their zone, it's something on the news, shots fired, somebody's injured, whatever, um, but it doesn't usually break into our consciousness, or, and, and when I say this, I mean, and my friend's consciousness until it gets someplace where it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be anywhere, okay? Um, but all of a sudden, it becomes something that we need to be concerned about. Now, let's get back to that 
first guy, that young offender. When somebody pleads guilty or is found guilty by a jury, they are entitled to have what we call a sentencing assessment report prepared. Probation and parole uh, does a workup. It's not nearly as extensive as it used to be, but it will tell me uh, the basic uh, information. When was he born? How far did he go in school? Uh, what was his family history like? Uh, were, his, were his parents married? Were they divorced? Where did they live? Um, what's his employment history? Uh, who are his siblings? Uh, what's his, his criminal history like? Um, and just a little bit of interview with him about what was his version of the events that led to him being convicted. Of these guys in that first category, I can usually write that, I could write that myself. I, I don't mean to, uh, I don't presume things about people, but the same things keep happening over and over again, and it's hard not to believe that my perceptions uh, are accurate. Okay, so what we've got for these shooters, I think, typically, now this is the middle of the bell curve, there are people on each side of that that are, don't fit this profile, but not very many. Um, born to a single mother, okay, so mom's at home, she's got other kids, she's distracted, she's not gonna give this guy the kind of attention that I was fortunate to get when I was a kid. Uh, she's, she may have her own substance abuse issues. Um, the young man may have been abused, but most likely not. He starts smoking marijuana when he's 10 or 12. I've seen it as young as six. Uh, by the time he's 14, he's smoking every day. And what you do when you're 12, 13, 14, you get good at. If you do math every day, you're gonna get good at math. If you do basketball every day or ice skating, you get good at basketball or ice skating. If you do marijuana every day, you get good at marijuana. And so by the time he's 16, by the time he's 14, he's smoking every day. He's out of school by the time he's 16. He has no job skills. He has no support system in the way that we would, we enjoy the support systems in our lives. And he's out riding around at night with his buddies and there's a gun in the car. Um, he doesn't have any money. He's impoverished. He feels oppressed. He feels like he doesn't have any control over his life. In my experience, a lot of these shooters tend to be smaller guys, okay? Um, and, but when they have that gun in their hand, they feel big. And every day, um, they spend not thinking ahead, okay? They don't look down the road to see what they could happen, what could happen to them. Uh, some examples of this. In February of 2013, there's a guy named Kenny Bell. He lived on Pacific Street, about two blocks from where I lived at my great grandparents' house when I first moved back to Cave. Um, there was a big house down there that was across the street from old St. Francis Hospital. And it was divided up into apartments. He's out on the sidewalk in the evening and he bumps into a guy on the sidewalk who's one of the residents of one of the other apartments and words are exchanged. Now, most of us would, you know, mutter something about that other guy and go back into our apartment and do whatever we were gonna do that night. But Kenny didn't, Kenny went in, got his nine millimeter, went down the hall and shot uh, his neighbor's girlfriend, Misty Cole, and he shot Sh Shannon James and he just shot the place all to pieces. He fired about 15 rounds. I mean, there were bullets that went through the floor. There were bullets that went through human beings. It was a horrendous mess. Um, then he tried to run and he got caught and he got investigated and he got convicted. I mean, he, they were, police were on him like that. And um, he's in the Missouri Department of Corrections now. Um, on May 14th of 2016, also Kenny Bell's kind of a slight guy. I can see 
he might have a little bit of an inferiority thing going on because um, Shannon James was a great big guy. Malcolm Harris was out with his buddies um, on May 14th of 2016. He was at a party and then he goes riding around with his buddies uh, all night. They're doing drugs and listening to music and drinking. And about, I think it was about 6.15 in the morning, he's in the back seat. He pulls out his gun, puts it to his friend's head and shoots him in the back of the head. There wasn't any argument. As far as I can figure out, he did it just to hear the gun go back. Killed his buddy, they dumped him in the woods down by May Green School. On May 1st of 2018, Anthony Sinks had been in a kind of a dispute with a guy named Derwin Simmons. Sinks had been married to a woman and he divorced her twice. And Derwin, who was an old friend of his from college, uh, was gonna meet up with her and move her to Ohio and take the kid with them. Um, now, Sinks was not exactly a small person, but it wasn't nearly as big as Simmons. And there was a long exchange of text messages of hateful things, sometimes hateful things that Anthony would say, and sometimes not so hateful. He borrowed a gun from a friend, practiced with it, and he just a complete chance encounter at Hardy's on William Street on the morning of May 1st. Uh, Derwin Simmons is in there. There's some back and forth like that. There's, and <clears throat> there's video of it, okay? And multiple chances to de-escalate, multiple chances to go do something else. At one point though, Simmons, who's a big guy and wearing gym shorts, and they both, well, I've got a carry permit and I've got a carry permit. Simmons starts to hitch up his shorts and uh, Sinks thinks he's going for a gun and shoots him, shoots him three times standing up and then twice when he's on the floor. Um, didn't have a gun. And when I talked to uh, Sinks at sentencing, it was a bench trial for some reason, he waved a jury. I said, you're gonna to go to your grave thinking that was self-defense, but it wasn't. He didn't have a gun. You had no reasonable belief that he was gonna shoot you because he didn't have a gun. If that would have been a Cape PD officer that had done that, Cape would still be smoldering. And he said, oh, well, that would be completely different. <laughs> if, if I'm a cop, if the shooter is a cop, it's different than if somebody shoots somebody illegally in Hardy's. One, piece of information about that. I, one of the police officers testified and when he got done, when he was done, I said, wait a minute, did you just tell me that when you got to Hardy's and Simmons was lying dead on the floor, that those old guys were still in the front drinking their coffee and eating their rolls? Yeah. <laughs> They're pretty devoted coffee drinkers at the Hardy's. Um, when we get to the end of things at sentencing, now the prosecuting, I, they've either pled guilty or we're having a sentencing after a jury trial. I'll turn to the prosecutor and say, what's the sentencing, what's the state's recommendation regarding sentence? And they will say whatever it is. Um, then I'll ask the defense attorney, what do they have to say? And there's a requirement that I have to ask the defendant if he has anything to say, and that's only fair. Um, very seldom anymore do they ever say that they're sorry. Uh, 30 years ago, when I was in Division Three, and admittedly, they were mostly lesser crimes. It wasn't murder, it wasn't assault first, but a lot of people would say, Judge, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make this right. And I haven't heard that for a long, long time. Now it's, Judge, that, that really isn't who I am. Oh yeah, so it was somebody dressed up in a U suit doing this stuff. Um, and I really, you know, I, I don't really think that what the prosecutor has in mind is consistent with my plan for my life. Oh really? Well, 
It doesn't work that way, but that's what they're saying now. The exception to that, remember that mean old man on Perryville Road, Tim Corrigan, who shot his wife in bed? He came to his senses while he was in jail. He stood up and turned around and told the courtroom was packed. Uh, Kathea Corrigan had a lot of friends and family, and he told them, and he was getting ready to go away for the rest of his life. And he said, I will not live long enough to suffer as much as I should for causing Kathea's death. That's one in a million, okay? But it does happen. One of the things that you think that you need to do when you're a judge, and to a certain extent, it's, it is appropriate, is at sentencing to lower the boom on the defendant, to condemn what they did, to um, to try to make them feel bad about it. Now, sometimes when there's a big case and there's a lot of community interest in it, it's particularly appropriate to do that. So like for Tim Waller, yeah, I did that. For Tim Kreitzer, I did that. And occasionally I did, that. I did it a lot more on just run of the mill cases starting out. And then I was at a meeting uh, with other presiding judges and I was talking to a guy and he said, you know what they're thinking while you're making that speech what? How long do I have to stand here and listen to this old man talk? And that's about it. And I realized he was right. Okay. So most of the time I'm just wasting my breath and I'm making the day longer than it needs to be. Now, Monday, I had a criminal docket. I had 124 cases on that docket. Please status conferences, sentencing, it was, a, it was a long day. I didn't need to make that day any longer. But every once in a while, I'd say about two or three times a year, I'll be sitting up there and some kid will come up for sentencing, 18 years old, usually not anything too serious, usually not a gun crime, okay? Um, and I will ask him in 10 years, okay, you're 18, in 10 years, would you like to have a nice place to live? Yes. Would you like to have a decent car to drive? Yes. Would you like to have somebody who cares about you when you come home at the end of the day? Yes. Well, how are you gonna get from where you are to there in 10 years? And the answer is always, huh? Or sports to that effect, okay? And they look at me like I've got two heads. Now, all of us, when we were 18, we could see the path to that outcome. These guys can't. And it's in part because they don't see that happening to their friends. It's chaos in their lives. And it's just one thing at a time it's called low horizons. They can't see what's coming based on their actions. Um, because when I'm talking to that kid, he's on the knife's edge, okay? He's, he's done with the juvenile people, okay? He's an adult. He's in adult court. I'm about to put him on probation. If he does what I say and what the probation people tell him to do, he could have a successful probation, not have a felony conviction hanging over his head for the rest of his life, become a productive citizen, have a happy life. On the other hand, he could walk out of that courtroom, fire up a joint, go hang out with his buddies and listen to some music and be back in jail by the next morning. Maybe not the next morning, but pretty quick, okay? And then it's a downward spiral and he's in and out of prison. Usually uh, these guys kind of give up on that life by the time they're about 40. Uh, I used to say the starch goes out of their shorts a little bit. Um, they just don't have the energy to live that way anymore. And they find some way that they can get along um, without, without being on the street all the time. So what do I think we ought to do? Well, the one thing that we ought to do, and the police have already come to this conclusion, is we need to get those illegal guns off the street. Okay? Um, that means 
stopping people for traffic offenses. That means asking for consent to search. That means taking, frisking the people that are, are pulled over and searching their cars. And it means when you think there might be guns, illegal guns in a house, you get a search warrant and you go search the house, okay? And you get the guns and you take them away and the bad guys don't get them again. Now, that's a, I mean, that's like trying to empty out the ocean with a teacup, but you gotta do it. You gotta try to get those guns off the street. I haven't been woken up in the middle of the night for a search warrant since 11.30 last night, okay? <laughs> it happens. We're all ready to do our job. Um, that's one thing, get the guns off the street. The other thing is, um, that young man who started smoking marijuana when he was 12 and was smoking every day when he was 14. Um, how do we change the hearts and minds of those guys? Okay. It, there, when I ran for judge, I, I told people there's a lot of satisfaction in looking some guy who's done something horrible in the eye and said, what you did is horrible and now you're about to pay for it. There's a lot of satisfaction in that, but there isn't any joy in it. There's joy in adoptions. I get to do them once a month, okay? But uh, no joy in sending somebody to prison for a long time. So everybody's got to keep doing their jobs. But I, until we change hearts and minds, the things that uh, you guys are worried about, we have, I think, very limited opportunity to, to make progress. And I, I have to, my family asked me that, I have to give them that answer. My friends ask me that, I have to give them that answer. You guys have asked me that and I have to give you that answer. But I'm happy to take any questions you might have now. And hey, Judge Lewis, thanks for the, uh, the time. Um, and I'm really encouraged by your comment for not trust and the um, chain. Uh, <clears throat> and you mentioned just a little bit there about juveniles. For this group that may not know, including me, what a juvenile is, whether they get to you or not, based upon their activities. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. And then secondly, what is a, what is a, what is a, what is an illegal gun? Okay. Well, I imagine you're going to hear from Kevin Grunwald, our juvenile officer, eventually. Um, the juvenile, one of the joys of being presiding judge is that makes, I'm the chief administrative officer, which means I hired Kevin, okay? And um, I'm in charge of the juvenile office, although I can't, that means I can't hear juvenile cases. A juvenile used to be somebody who was under 18. And then um, there was a shooting over in Jackson. There was a, a love triangle, okay? and. The loser in that triangle lured the winner over to a car wash in Jackson and shot the other guy uh, with a 22 and left him as a paraplegic, okay? The shooter, the, that case ended up being assigned to David Dolan, the circuit judge in Scott County. And this kid was, um, At the time, I guess he was 18. At, at that time, he would have been younger than 17. Okay, but he got certified, yes. right? Yes. He got certified to stand trial as an adult. Yes. You, you look at when somebody, when that happens, it's almost always on a very serious crime. There's a whole, the, the juvenile court, the rules actually set by Congress. They've got this whole grid that when they get pick up some child, they have to go through all these steps to certify to to establish objectively that there's a reason to detain that child in a detention center, and the detention center capability has been shrunk dramatically over the time that I've been on the bench. Um, when somebody is when something terrible happens, then it's a question of um, 
Is it a serious enough crime to certify them to stand trial as an adult? And are there any juvenile court uh, resources that would rehabilitate this child? Um, if those, uh, if the answer is no, then they go into the adult system. They have to be segregated in terms of where they're housed, but um, they go into the adult system, they stand trial as, as, an, as an adult and receive um, an adult sentence. Now, what I was getting at with the guy at the car wash was, um, the shooter's mom took offense at the idea that he was being prosecuted as an adult. And when he got to the Department of Corrections, he hanged himself. And she was even more incensed. I, I get it. She, I would assume she had some element of feeling guilty about this herself, but she was angry at everybody else about it. Uh, Dolan gave him 20 years, I think. Uh, and rather than face a 20 year sentence, he hanged himself in the jail. Now, she went on a campaign to raise the age to make, uh, to you, that you wouldn't be, it used to be you were an adult at 17, then it moved up to 18, which increased, imagine how many 17 year old offenders that there were out there. All of a sudden, those people aren't in, in the adult system anymore, all of a sudden, it, you shove all of those into the juvenile system. Created a huge strain on the juvenile system. Um, the legislature, in their infinite wisdom, did not fund it. There was a provision in there that said it wouldn't be effective until it was funded. Um, and eventually they did fund it, but it, it changed things. Um, But in terms of, of what, to, I'll let Kevin take up for the juvenile system when it's his turn, but um, they investigate complaints against juveniles. They have to document them. If somebody's unhappy about it, they've got the paperwork that shows what was reported and what the outcome was. Um, did I answer your question? What's an illegal gun? An illegal gun, okay. Um, it's not so much that the guns are illegal. Um, usually it's that they're possessed illegally. If, if somebody has a felony conviction in any state, it's illegal in Missouri to possess a firearm. And there's, that's, I, in the materials I gave you, you can see that's a D felony punishable by up to seven years in the Department of Corrections. In the federal system, I think it's punishable by up to 15 years. So a lot of times those felon in possession cases will be filed with the feds because they're gonna end up doing more time there. It is illegal um, to possess a defaced firearm. Somebody gets the bright idea that they can scratch the serial number off and they won't get in trouble. Well, that's a felony um, to possess that firearm. It's a felony to possess a stolen firearm um, you can't possess, unless you have a license, which is almost impossible to get, you can't possess a fully automatic weapon. Um, I, I've got a, a SKS and an AR-15 uh, locked up in my basement, um, but neither one of those are, is fully automatic, okay? The, the AR looks a lot more like a machine gun, but it's not a machine gun. It only shoots one projectile each time you pull the trigger. Um, so it's not illegal, but if it was fully automatic, uh, we are seeing occasionally some, I've had some cases where there have been some automatic weapons, not so much. The thing is, I don't just see Cape County. I've got Perry County and Bullinger County, but I've also got people on probation who, who are distributed all over the place. And so I had a, one of my probationers got involved in a murder in Mississippi County where somebody, because he wanted the other guy's fully automatic uh, machine pistol, okay? And that uh, back and forth over that weapon did not end well uh, for the other guy, so. 
Those are illegal weapons. We are seeing a lot more of those. They're called switches. Uh, ATD and ATF are very aware of those. What they are, they're clock switches. Um, they make the firearm, the, the handgun, fully automatic by just inserting a simply uh, like 3D printed um, device to put it into the uh, handgun. What they'll do is put an extended mag on it. Um, that actually makes the machine. So we'll file that as a felony. Hopefully then the feds will pick it up and the U.S. Attorney's Office will file it as well. That's a so you mentioned one of the uh, one of the recommendations or even, even some of the things that KPD is doing is more stops. Uh, well, I didn't say they were doing it. I didn't say they were doing it. I'm saying that's the way you get it done. Okay, okay. So You'd have to talk to them about what they're what their uh, MO is on that. Okay. So, so back to the gun, when, when, if, if we do that, if it's done, and there is a gun found, how do you determine whether it's, um, I mean, do we, as Missouri residents, do we have to register our guns? No. So I mean, I could, I could sell you that gun. AR in my basement and there's no paperwork between you and me. Okay, so, so how do we know that that gun is stolen? Because it's got a serial number on it. And if it was stolen out of anybody, some guy, I never leave a weapon in my vehicle, like when overnight when it's parked. Um, I, I wouldn't. Well, Judge, I don't want to interject. That's a big problem with guns in the vehicle. It just over the weekend, we had several cars that were broken into to get a roll up lock and all that stuff. Yeah, so that's a big problem here. And I've, I've had friends who had guns stolen. I'm like, what were you doing leaving your yeah, gun in the car when you went to bed yeah, last night? Yeah. Okay, so somebody gets picked, a young offender gets picked up on the street and he's got a gun. They run the serial number on it and they can do it pretty darn quick. And it comes back as stolen. Okay. So, because it. Whoever, whoever it was stolen from had the serial number and they told the police, hey, my Glock with this serial number was stolen out of my truck last night. And that goes into a national database, I think. And, and for prosecution, one of the hardest things for the people to see then is if the gun is stolen out of Arizona, then we have to get the victim to come testify out of Arizona to come to take well, the person from Arizona just wants their gun back. They don't care whether or not the person's actually prosecuted. They're not going to come here and say, hey, right? Um, so that's the issue. These guns are coming all over the place. They're not just stolen here and then staying here. They're going all over the place, coming in from all over the place. Yeah. Nationwide, most guns when they're stolen are out of people. That there are some with burglaries, but most of them. Mark, do you, I'm sorry, do you mean that um, any uh, stolen gun used in a crime, the, the, the person who uh, the gun was stolen from, wherever they live, they have to be somehow... So, so if I want to file a charge for this possessing a stolen firearm, I have to actually prove that it was stolen. Mm -hmm. That's not one of the crimes. It was stolen that they possessed it without the, with depriving the other individual of I have to have the person they stole it from to come in and testify. Well, if they, the owner is in Arizona, they don't they don't care about coming to the case, right? But even someone in case would have to it, go it, to trial. That's right. Judge Lewis, I know that um, Judge Lewis he presides over the drug court. Right. Can you um, just talk about what that does, and, and is that helping with the issue of um, capacity in the jails? Okay, the drug court is is a treatment program, okay? And um, rather than send somebody to serve a sentence, the prosecutor's office and the drug court administrator screen people for admission into this program would it really help them? Are they really willing to apply themselves to this? They meet on Friday mornings. It's more of a kind of a 
little bit of a group therapy program. And they talk about how everybody's coming along in the program and who tested positive, who's relapsed. How are you, how are you moving forward in this? And the idea is to use, um, the judge doesn't wear a robe when he's doing it. He, it's a, little, a lot more informal. And the idea is to develop rapport with the people that are in the program. Um, and they get referred out to inpatient treatment. They get referred out to outpatient treatment. Uh, if they mess up, they might have to do a few days in the county jail as a punishment for, uh, for, not, doing what, for not going to treatment, for not doing something they were supposed to do. Um, we, we send people to private treatment programs. We send people to drug court. Um, we have a program for a 120 day treatment program in the Department of Corrections. Drug court is short of that. And the idea is that in that community setting, maybe we can get people redirected um, because not everybody's willing to go to Teen Challenge, okay? Teen Challenge is a really tough program and you got to do what the Assembly of God people tell you to do. And I don't have any problem with that, but a lot of people do. They just don't want to, they don't want to comply. So yeah, the idea is that we, we uh, reduce the, prison population by having successful treatment programs while people are on probation. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I could not, I, you'd have to check, maybe Mark could check for you with Judge Lipke about what their recidivism rate is, but I don't, it's his program. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I would add to that, not that you need me to add, but I need to facilitate those group meetings. Sometimes when those people are sentenced to those they don't want to be there. They let you know they don't want to be there. However, as a facilitator or as a counselor, you have a lot of leeway encouraging them and reminding them why, why they are there or there are other uh, extenuating circumstances that they're going to have to deal with. So you have to be honest and, and come forward and talk about why you're there and, and move forward. So you have a lot of leeway to work with those people and then you have those that are there and they want it, they want to do the right thing. But again, with drug court and everything, those drugs, uh, many of them are addicted. So it, it is a battle that is fighting here. In, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's making up for some parenting that they didn't get. You had a question? Yes. Um, so if you get a repeat offender that constantly like comes before you like he goes to jail, he says, oh, I'm going to do better. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this. Except that they don't say that. That's sorry. Part. I know it as well. You know, but anyway, if they come, you know, come back repeatedly in front of you, do you experience their sentencing or what is the process for if you have someone that comes before you like every other week or every couple of weeks? What's the like the process for that. Well, kind of the way it usually works. And again, this is not going to be so much on gun violence mm -hmm. crimes because those, those kind of go on a different track. I'm a lot more worried about those. But let's say a guy comes in and it's uh, at 18 and it's possession of methamphetamine. Initially, he's probably going to get a suspended imposition of sentence, which means technically no felony conviction he gets five years of probation, he fails at that. We try uh, continuing him with some additional conditions of probation, uh, maybe a court order detention sanction program. He does 120 days in the Department of Corrections. He persists, he picks up another offense. Then he gets a seven year sentence. He serves about 18 months of that maybe. Um, he comes back. Uh, the next time, maybe he makes probation if he's got some story that he can persuade me that he might actually have a successful probation, mm -hmm. but probably next time around. I mean, you get to a point with these people fairly quickly, okay, you don't care about doing the right thing. So when you get caught, you're going to go to prison. And that's part of my speech to that 18-year-old kid. Okay, you've got your chance, but here's what happens. After this, 
you go to prison and then you get out, you go back to prison, you get out, you go back to prison. Is that the life you want? I, again, there's no joy in, in, in sending them to prison. And then a lot of times it starts in the household. Like, like oh, yeah. said, lack of I've seen lack three of generations of, yeah. of people. Some of them, uh, you know, guys I was in high school with. Um, it happens. Absolutely. And a lot of these, this kid that I'm talking about, this 18 year old that pulls the gun, um, I think, based on what I've seen and what I've read, that he doesn't regard the person on the other end of the barrel as fully human because he hasn't learned to regard himself fully human in the way that you and I do, okay? I mean, the, the thought of, of killing another person would just crush us. And it's no big deal. He, he disrespected me. And so out comes the gun. Laura, Well, if you buy one lawfully, some, if you buy one lawfully, you have a receipt for it someplace, and someplace there's a box that I don't know all the serial numbers for all my guns, but I've got boxes at home with all the serial numbers. But is that a typical, is that a typical gun owner behavior? Is that kind of what? And, yeah, and, 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 and you keep track of it, but but these guys don't. Okay, these guys can't even tell you what kind of gun, what model it was. The ones who steal it. Right. Yeah. I, well, I noticed if, if, if our recourse is to actually go back to the victim, I'm just wondering, you know, not that, not that we want to blame the victim or hold them accountable, but where we have control, what can we do to educate gun owners about making sure you know your serial numbers, you have them ready, you always report it stolen. This is the reasons people don't want to report it. I don't think the serial number thing is a problem. Do you, Adam? Not a common problem. It's happened before where a gun was stolen. But the, the not keeping track of the weapon is a is a problem. You know, yeah, keeping it in a safe the place. Unattended with the vehicle locked. So that was my other question. What are, what are the laws around the storage of guns? Can you, is it legal to store a gun in a vehicle locked? Is it illegal to store a gun in There aren't any. There are no. It's okay to store it in your. You, I could, I could, I, if, I could have left the, my handgun on the seat of my truck parked across the street when I came in the meeting, and it would be perfectly legal. Stupid, but perfectly legal. Well, there is, yes, okay. If I sign a ex parte or a full order of protection, then the respondent cannot legally possess a firearm. But that doesn't mean that he won't, okay? It's a piece of paper that says that he's not supposed to. And they don't stop bullets. Somebody else had a question. Yes. Um, 
about how you can give them a better salary, better things to do, where they grow up wanting to become, you know, so better. Well, when, from time to time, I get a high school class in my courtroom and I let them watch a little bit of the uh, criminal docket and get the prisoners out of there and go talk to the kids. And I say, here's how you don't end up up there or going through now, it's going through the secure door into the holding area. Um, finish high school, okay, get a job. Don't quit that job until you get another one. Don't have a baby until you're married. And don't use drugs, okay? Get them better parents. I think that's a great discussion topic right there. But I would just like to narrow you your questions specifically for our judge because sort of we had court. I got a jury trial <laughs> going. I got a civil jury trial in Jackson. I got a, I promised I'd I might be a little late, but I gotta get going. Sir, I uh I heard you early on about excuse me, support systems. Uh do you have statistics that you know you said, hey, if you have a single mom, we kind of been back a little bit, but those support systems that are in place associated with a lower caliber gun violence, if there's with proactive families and organizations and support systems in the different cities that you've been judged, is there statistics that say, hey, this worked here, but we have to invoke those support systems early to be proactive, early on with families? There are statistics that show if you have these deficits, you're more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. I don't know if there are any statistics that say if you do these things, you can make things better. I've never read that report. Anyway, thank you all very much. I got to go back and see my jury. This concludes the presentation portion of the Cape Girardeau Gun Violence Task Force meeting. Preceding this presentation is an hour-long discussion session among all task force members and a meeting adjournment at 9 a.m., for more information about this meeting and all future meetings, visit www.cityofcape.org/gvtf. Thank you for watching.